morning, the gospel reading is Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. God, thanks be to God. Anybody willing to pray for the preacher today? Here comes Keith. Thank you, sir. Let there be peace in her, and let it begin with us. Let there be peace of mind, the peace without wanton fuss. With God as our Father, mother to me is she. Let me walk with my mother in perfect harmony. Amen. Thank you. Y'all know I'm an English major, right? It's another nerd sermon. Here we go. Anybody familiar with the word portmanteau? Portmanteau is two words put together that mean another word. If that makes any sense, they sort of go together, they flow together. Motel is the combination of which two words? It's an old one. Motor, hotel is a motel. Brunch is what? Breakfast and lunch, you got it now. That's a portmanteau. It comes from an old um, word for a piece of luggage that had two parts that folded together and made one. But um, there's another one that's more recent called frenemy. What do you think a frenemy is? Friend who's an enemy, really? Or an enemy who might be a little friendly? So like those guys that come up to Jesus and say, oh, Lord, we got a question for you because you are so wise. Mm -hmm. Were they really his friends? Did they really respect him? No, they were trying to entangle him and trap him. Literally, like if you, you know, dig the hole and put the rug over it and hope Jesus say, come on over, sir. And he falls in. They want to trap him. They want to kill him. Maybe instead of friend of me, you heard the expression, politics makes strange bedfellows. There are a lot of people who fit that description in the world right now. Israel's government is united right now. The Labor Party is united with the more progressive party, which is aligned with the conservatives right now. Why is that? They have a common enemy. It's just like all those sci-fi movies where the Earth is being attacked and suddenly everybody on the planet gets along together to fight off whatever alien or asteroid is headed towards like a bowling ball, right? So here we are with Jesus and these people who are trying to trick him. Now maybe you've heard of Pharisees. Pharisees are the devotees to the Jewish law. They are the best of the Jews in their opinion. Better than those Sadducees, better than the scribes, better than any other person practicing the Jewish faith at that time because they had God on their side, because they were a strict adherence to the law. And as long as you did the letter of the law, you were okay in God's sight. So they were all in and everybody else was out. But the Herodians, not so much. Herodians who are adherents to whom? Herod. Oh, that makes sense, doesn't it? Not Herod the Great, the one who was so threatened by the idea of Jesus being born that he had every child under the age of two slaughtered in his crib. Sounds familiar like the world today, doesn't it? This is his son, Herod Antipas, who is going to be threatened by Jesus being the king of the Jews. Even though he'd like to know more about him and like to get close to him and see him and have all those 
weird little things that happen near the end of the story. And we're very near to the end of the story now. This is happening when Jesus is in the temple of all places, the heart of Jewish worship. He is at the temple when this encounter takes place. Herodians and Pharisees would never even acknowledge each other, much less speak to one another, unless they had a common enemy, and their common enemy is Jesus. Because the Herodians don't want to lose their power. And Herod was put in place as the king of the Jews by whom? By the Jews? No. Nope. By God? No. Ho, ho. By the Roman emperor. Come, Jesus. Jesus, you're so wise. Jesus, you're so good. Jesus, you're so wonderful. Tell us. We have a question for you, Lord. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor? Now, if Jesus says yes, pay your taxes, what's he going to incur the wrath of the Pharisees who hated Rome and wanted Rome out of their place altogether. They wanted them out of the Holy Land, out of the temple, out of Jerusalem. But the Herodians were in power because of the emperor, so they wanted, they wanted him to say, don't pay your taxes, because then he would be arrested and possibly put to death by Rome as being someone who was seditious. And Jesus says to them, why are you trying to test me, you hypocrites? Hypocrite being a word that literally comes from the theater, meaning someone who wears a mask to hide their identity. So he says, you know, you got this mask on, it's all smiles and loveliness, but you don't want, you don't want to know what I really think. So he tells them what he thinks, doesn't he? He asks for a coin. Jesus has no money in his pocket. Why is that? Not necessarily because he's poor, but he's not going to have a Roman coin in his pocket in the temple. One of them pulls one out really fast, sort of like busted, because the Roman coin of this day would have had a picture on it of Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, and it would have had an inscription on it. What is inscribed on it, what is imprinted on it, is really what the word would be in, translated from the Greek. What, what's the imprint on that? It would say, Tiberius Caesar, son of Caesar, who is divine, meaning this is the Son of God. Now that breaks a couple of commandments right there, doesn't it? You shall have no graven image. You shall have no God before me. But here they have Tiberius in the coin. And I guess at some point they went, uh-oh, we have this coin, don't we? Because that's why they had money changers in the temple. Because you had temple tax to pay, but people had to pay taxes to Rome. It's pretty steep. A denarius was one day's wage had to pay. And he went 14 and up, so my dear, you'd be paying taxes if you were living under Roman oppression in the first century in Jerusalem. You'd be paying tax. Sarah's looking like, I don't have a job. Well, you'd be paying tax anyway, right? So, Jesus says, whose picture and what is printed on this coin? And they, they hand him the coin and they say, Caesar. Jesus says, give to Caesar what belongs to him and give to God what belongs to God. What belongs to God? Wouldn't this be nice if, I could, if we could do this next month when we do stewardship month and we could say, give, pay your taxes like good American citizens, but then give 10% to the church, amen, right? How many of you have ever heard that? I've heard that preached on this passage before. That's not what this is talking about. Who bears the image of God? The kids got it up here this morning very quickly. Who bears the image of God? We do. We do. Humankind created in God's image. Doesn't mean you look a certain way, doesn't mean you dress a certain way, doesn't mean you talk a certain way, doesn't mean you have an accent or a different language, doesn't mean your skin's a particular color. It means that you have the image of God in your heart. It means you love. No matter what the world does to you, you return it with love. You return it with prayer. You return it with gratitude to God for your life. Now let's look back at this Isaiah passage. How many of you thought, why do we read this Old Testament stuff? It just confuses us. Cyrus. Who was Cyrus? Very ironic to think who Cyrus was. Cyrus, it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes. To open doors before him that the gates shall not be closed. Cyrus of Persia, Cyrus II, who was the Persian emperor, very powerful man in his day. This is about 600 years before Jesus was born. And Isaiah prophesied that Cyrus would be the anointed of God. What does the 
be anointed by God. There's a specific title for that. What is it? Messiah. The only non-Jew in scripture, and the first time this is used, the anointed one of God is for Cyrus of Persia, the Persian king. And I said it's ironic because where is ancient Persia in today's world? Iran. Iran. Do not think I am saying that that means that Hamas or Hezbollah or any of those organizations that are destroying the Jewish population, that's their mission and their goal, to destroy Jews. I'm not saying that they're right, that they're God's anointed one, because God's anointing passed from that generation. But saying God can use anybody anytime God wants, you don't have to be a Pharisee to be used by God. You don't even have to be a Jew to be used by God. In this circumstance, this is someone who was not even Jewish. This is a heathen, a Gentile. This is someone, an outsider, that God is going to anoint and use for a purpose. You know what that purpose was? Why Cyrus was called the anointed Messiah of God? Because he's the one who kicked Nebuchadnezzar right on out of the holy city of Jerusalem. Not only did he do that, if you go to the United Nations, they have something, they have a model of what is called the um, Cyrus Cylinder, which is a clay tablet that is round, it's almost like a football shape. And on it is inscribed the first social justice laws ever recorded. Cyrus not only let the people return to the holy city, he let them rebuild their temple and worship their God. And the God of Israel is mentioned in the cylinder of Cyrus. There's a copy of the United Nations, the original is in the British Museum right now. So what do we make of all this? I think we need to reclaim the image of God in our lives. We have to put down our animosity toward anyone else on the planet and say, in God's name I will love, in God's name I will care for others, in God's name I will forgive, I will forgive, I will forgive, as I have been forgiven by God, I will so forgive others. It means to have generosity in your heart means that every single thing that you own, everything that you are is God's, and you understand that every moment of every day. You wake up and you say, thank you, Lord God, Jesus Christ, for your saving love in my life. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the peace that you bring to my heart in these troubled times. Thank you for my call and for my mission in the world, because that is what it is to bear the image of God. Well, maybe icon is a strange concept to you, but what about branding? A lot about branding these days, right? What was branding originally? They put a hot iron on you and they mark you for your owner, right? Usually cattle, but we've seen people being marked. Days of slavery in the United States, some people were literally branded. And then in the concentration camps, people had numbers subscribed on their arms. Do you know what they do in the Holy Land, Palestinian Christians, they tattoo something on their wrists. Have you ever seen that? What do they tattoo on their right hand, their right wrist? A cross. In a land that's hostile towards Christians as well as hostile towards Jews, they tattoo a cross on their hand. They do it on their children as soon as they're old enough to take a tattoo, which is about two years old. Because every time you do business, they want people to understand who they are who they are in that context, which could bring about their own death. If they're seen to evangelize in an Islamic state, they could be put to death for that. They want everyone to know who they belong to. We use brand in a different way now. You know, what brand of toothpaste do you use? How are you branding yourself? I want you to go out and get a, maybe you want a tattoo. If you want a tattoo, get a tattoo. I had a young adult once say to me, Pastor Chad, I want you to come with me to pick out my tattoo. I was like, I'm not my job. He said, no, I want a cross. I want to know what they all mean. There were so many. I want you to come and tell me what they all mean. Not a bad thing. What is the brand that you carry around in your heart? Who owns you? Who controls you? Who do you belong to? I hope it's Jesus Christ, and I hope you put him above everything else in your life. Because if we don't do that, the world is going to literally slip away and to darkness. Paul's writing in the first letter to the Thessalonian church, the oldest writing in the New Testament. So this is the oldest writing that we have. It came years before the Gospels, decades before the Gospels were written. Paul wrote the letter to the church in Thessaloniki, is the modern-day 
part of the Greece where he wrote too wasn't treated particularly well there when he traveled through to Philippi and places like that where he was thrown in prison. But he says, this is God reaching through him to the Gentile world because we are called to love all people and to reach out to all people, not just those like us, not to those who are men, not to those who are women, not to those who are white, not to those who are black, not to those who are Asian or any other nationality or ethnicity, not to the Jews against the Gentiles, but to all people people in the name of Jesus Christ we are called to love we are called to bear witness to the truth of God and Jesus Christ to everyone we meet be hard wouldn't it except we were made in the image of that God we just have to remember that and act like it so look around this congregation for a moment I want you to really look around at the people here with you literally look you can turn your head look at them not everybody looks alike, do they? Not everybody has the same accent here, we're lucky to say. But every one of you bears the image of God, and if you don't see it, you've got to look harder because it's there. And look in the mirror and see it. And if it's been dimmed or dulled by overuse or over-hypocrisy or a little craziness in your life, remember you are created in the image of God, and that means something powerful in this world. We all have power, don't we? We just don't always think that we have power. So what I want you to do is to love one another as deeply as you can. I want you to forgive one another. And people say to me all the time, I have nothing against anybody here, but then they'll say something awful about somebody else. Can't do that, folks. We've got to love and forgive from the depths of our hearts. Because Christ, from the depth of his heart, has forgiven us. We could just put the mask on and be hypocrites, but take off the mask and look at yourself and you will see the image of God looking back at you. Amen? Amen. Amen.